this Ottawa branch meeting. Air to air collisions, drone impact damage assessment on aircraft structure. Uh, the introduction of our speakers, there are actually two who will be participating in the presentation today. Uh, that'll be done by the chair of the Ottawa branch, um, Jeff Bird. Uh, and uh, Jeff has been the chair for quite a number of years now, along with Omar Majid, uh, his Ottawa colleague. Um, we're very grateful to Jeff and Omar for uh, leading the Ottawa branch for such a long and sustained time and with such success. Uh, branch meetings now take place uh, in the ether in a virtual environment for the time being. And um, that really gives us an opportunity as much as it's kind of a drawback to have a touch-free experience. Uh, it does enable branch meetings to have a national reach. And we're hoping that by way of having promoted the Ottawa branch from coast to coast that will be able to, uh, to cater to the interests of people right across Canada. And this particular program, uh, I think, will be of interest to the aeronautical community um, from one uh, ocean to the other because this kind of activity with drones is, um, is a very widespread one and development is taking place everywhere in Canada. Um, Jeff, I'd like to once again to thank you for uh, leading the Ottawa branch and uh, this meeting being a case in point, uh, I'd like to hand off to you now and, uh, and uh, to take over as chair. Thank you, Jeff, uh, and thank you, Todd and, and April in advance for helping organize this. I welcome everyone to this Ottawa branch extended to the whole Cassie community to explore some technical ideas over lunch. Hopefully while you're having a, a break from your regular schedule, we'll try and keep tightly to the one o'clock. We can go a little bit longer if there are more questions. Um, I would like to introduce uh, two speakers. We have a bonus speaker today that, that will uh, you'll be interested to hear from. I'm sure Azadine Dadouche, Dr. Azadine Dadouche is the research officer Senior Research Officer, of National Research Council of Canada. His research interests are topics related to rotor uh, support systems for gas turbines, such as fluid film bearings, oil foil bearings, and rolling element bearings. He has worked with some not notable co colleagues, Keith Brockwell and Baldek Domchowski in the past, and I would recognize their past contributions to their work along with his. Recently, he's been working in studying damage severity resulting from aired -air, air collisions, such as bird and drone impact on aircraft and rotorcraft structures, including windshields, wings, and empennage. Uh, uh, we have also another member of the team that worked on this, Carlos Ruella from Transport Canada, and he's with the RPS Task Force Engineering Group and he will be presenting some of the regulatory parts of the work and we thank Carlos for his uh, contribution today and support for this important work that's uh, uh, part of the Canadian aerospace activity and part of the contributions to safe uh, aerospace activities in Canada. So without further ado, I welcome and thank you in advance and Azadine, over to you. And please post any questions you have on the chat room and I'll try and manage those. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this presentation. I hope uh, we'll find it very interesting. Um, so, trying to make it able to make it um, full screen here for some reason. I'm not able to make it full screen. Is there something I can do here? Strange. Are you actually using a secondary monitor? No, 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 it's, it's my laptop only. Okay, it should be fine. I tried it, so it, it worked. I don't know why it's not working. Okay. Try hitting the F 
five key. Okay, now. Okay, so as uh, as uh, as Jeff mentioned, so today we'll be talking uh, about uh, a very interesting topic, which is related to air-to-air uh, -to -air collisions. In air-to-air -to -air -to collisions, you have either a collision between two aircrafts, between a bird and an aircraft, or between a drone and an aircraft. So today I'll be giving kind of uh, a short uh, uh, background on bird impact in general, and then I will. Uh, I will discuss the topic of drone impact. So this presentation uh, is uh, presented, as you can see, so it's with a little background, then talk about the certification requirements for bird impact ingestion. After that, I will talk about the, uh, uh, the drones, or as we call them here, remotely piloted aircraft systems, Airbus. And then I will uh, show what NRC is doing in this area before I describe some of the work that we have done and finish by giving some conclusions. So, as you may know, or as you may or may not know, in Canada, for hey. example, we have... Sorry, you just happened to call right in the middle of my intro there. Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, I didn't tell you there was a branch meeting. Yes, uh, should I continue here or what? Yes, carry on, sorry about that. Okay, sure. Yeah, so as I said, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, so in Canada, we have about 2,000 bird strike events every year. And here I have the statistics of for the last five years. In 2015, we had about 1750, and then 1865 in 2016, up to 2,151 bird impact on an aircraft just in one single year. In those impacts, what we have, these are the impacts which, which, which caused damage to the aircraft. So we had in 2015, for 15, we had about 71 on the windshield, 116 on the engine or propeller, and 317 on the wing or the body or tail of the aircraft. In 2019, we had about 70, almost the same number, 128 for the engine and 365 for the body, wings and tails. For the aircraft, for the military aircraft, we have a little bit less as you can compare between those two columns. In the United States, actually, the bird impacts uh, grew from 1800 in 1990 to 16,000 in 2018. This is a significant increase in this type of impacts. This map here, which is which gives a few airports in, in the USA, starting from very small airports to very big airports, where you have, for example, 226,000 flights a year. On this one, you have about 24,700 flights a year. And as you can see, the percentage of bird impact, 0.13 or 0.14 percent, in here about 0.11%. So anyway, so if you go around all the airports, so the average is about 0.12 or 0.13%. The UK science or central science laboratory estimates that the total worldwide cost to airline due to bird strikes is about $1.2 billion. I believe you all remember this, uh, this picture. This is the aircraft which uh, uh, it's US Airways flights, which uh, struck a, a flock of birds during the climbing period and two engines actually failed. And uh, the, the pilots were so great and uh, were successful in landing the aircraft in, the, uh, in, the, in New York's Hudson uh, River. So this, uh, this incident, there was no casualties Thank God for that, but we had about 100 injuries. Still problems with bird impacts. So this is on a turbofan. This is in 2020 in Berlin, no injuries. This is uh, a Boeing 727. This is in Kazakhstan. So a flock of birds caused the damage to the, uh, the, the, uh, the fan of the engine, no injuries either. This is another one uh, in Russia. So 
10 injuries, but the aircraft actually had, you know, crashed. But thank God, as I said, no injuries. However, sometimes it could be very, very tough. This is, if you can remember that uh, incident in 2009 in Louisiana, where a Sikorsky helicopter crashed due to, the, to an impact of a red-tailed hawk on, you know, and, uh, you know, penetrated through the windshield and forced the engine to lose power and crashed. So eight out of the nine passengers sadly passed away. So the FAA estimates actually that there, there is about 200 worldwide deaths since 1988. Certification requirements. So for bird impact, so bird impact testing is mandatory uh, 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 and uh, every single airframe manufacturer or uh, engine manufacturer must certify their products uh, uh, in, in, you know, in order to be able to fly. So uh, what we use during those certification uh, tests, birds for sure, but these are not real, not live birds, but these are bird carcasses. Uh, sometimes we use gelatin-based synthetic imitation of birds. You can use it for, for calibration, but work is still uh, 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 going on, you know, to have kind of a nice recipe, you know, to, uh, you know, to be used for certification purposes. Uh, the National Research Council of Canada is one of the multiple agencies in North America that supports aircraft and engine manufacturers to certify their products. And actually, NRC started uh, bird impact testing back in 1965, and we are still doing that now. Okay, this is just a quick summary on uh, what are the requirements. So for uh, Part 25 aircrafts, this is transport category aircrafts. So the entire airplane must be certified for birds, which are about 1.8 kilograms. This is four pounds. For the empennage, which is the vertical and horizontal stabilizers. So this part must be certified for birds, which are 3.6 kilograms in weight. This is eight pounds. For the windshield, so the impact, so the windshield must survive an impact of a bird weighing 1.8 kilograms. No penetration is allowed to be certified. So this is for part 25, for part 23, uh, for this aircraft between 10 and 19 seats, you have different uh, weight requirements, about one kilogram here for the windshield. But for part 23, for the acrobatic aircraft, actually there is no requirement at all. For uh, helicopters, Far 29, the windshield must, uh, must uh, support uh, an impact of a bird weighing one kilogram without penetration. In all cases, the airplane must be capable of successfully completing the flight and landing safely after such an impact. For engines, it's the same. So for the engines, depending on, on the size of the engine, you may have birds as small as 85 grams, uh, and or can be as big as four pounds, which is 1.8 kilograms, depending on the size of the engine. And in those two cases, for the for the 85 grams or 680 grams, when you certify it, or when you impact, or when you do the bird ingestion test, the engine the engine must not lose more than 25 percent of its power. Otherwise, it's a fail, and the engine is not allowed to fly. For big engines, for the four pound, so the engine is not, the engine must not catch fire, burst, or lose the capability to be shut down. Okay, so this was just a quick introduction for bird certification or bird impact. Now, wh wh what, about, what about the drones? I think that the drones are the best innovation or the best invention we had over the last 20 years or so. I just love them. You know, now with, with, with drones, you can do surveillance. You can go to remote areas and, you know, do a lot of good stuff without having to send people to do it. You can also use it for food delivery. There is a pizza delivery area. You can also use it for good delivery, which is great. You can also enjoy the drone and explore the world. Nice picture, nice environments. 
this is really great invention. Of course, not that type of, of drones. This is a manned one. So this is uh, this guy who uh, converted his bathtub to a drone and he flew somewhere to buy, uh, I think a treat or whatever, and then went back home. I don't know what happened to this guy. I think it happened in Germany a few years ago, but uh, good luck for him. This is not allowed. Now, as we said, the drones are great, but is there a chance that this drone, while doing good stuff, can interfere with an aircraft? Hmm. There is a chance there, I believe. What are the risks? So now, especially now, everybody has a drone. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people have drones now. So there is a huge increase in drone operation by professional and inexperienced users resulting in several incidents throughout the world, in particular near airports. So this is a big problem. So this is number one for people who are not experienced or who, who are careless. But we have another category of people who are malicious people. These are uh, these malicious op uh, 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 operators or operations of such smart uh, drones or smart devices may result in significant damage to airplanes and unfortunate fatalities. I will not talk about this story. So you know what happened. I don't know if it was a real story or not for uh, uh, Venezuelan President Maduro, I think, or Maduro, I believe, uh, who, uh, you know, who was, they tried to ass assassinate him using a drone back in 2019. Either it's true or not, but the people use the drone anyway. So they can use it in a very, very bad way, actually. Selected worldwide incidents, there is a lot of incidents there, but so far we haven't heard about a crash due to uh, uh, you know, uh, an impact uh, of a drone with, uh, with an aircraft. But we had some you know, few issues there, here and there, damage to the aircraft. This is one of the examples for Boeing 737-800. This, this was on final approach, six, 67 meters above the ground level, so the drone hit the nose of the aircraft. It caused damage to the, you know, to the nose. But you can imagine if this drone was ingested by the engine, what could have happened? So there is a risk somewhere there. Now, uh, regulations. I will just pass the, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, 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 pass it to my uh, to my colleague uh, Carlos Rilam from uh, Transport Canada, from Transport Canada to talk about regulations uh, regarding this matter. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. So, yeah, I'm supporting. Uh, we're supporting this work that um, that I say and the NRC is doing uh, regarding drone impact severity. And uh, I'm here just to talk a little bit of our current regulations and uh, and some statistics that we have collected uh, so far. So first, you can see here uh, the number in the first graph, the number of registered drones that are here in Canada. We are uh, we we mandate that every drone owner register every drone they own between 250 grams and 25 kilograms under the current PAR-9 regulations. And if you see that big spike there that happened in June 2019, that's when their rules came into force. So that's where there was a lot of um, drones registered. But, you know, the main takeaway here is that, uh, uh, you know, back uh, last year, there was already 4,700 drones registered in Canada and they keep registering every day. We have new registrations. Now, there, there's recently some, um, you know, technological advancements that uh, allow drones to get smaller and smaller. And uh, uh, here we show one picture of a specific manufacturer that developed one a drone under 250 grams. Now, it's important to know that, that that limit of 250 grams, we put that limit there based on the severity of an impact that a drone that small with that little mass and energy could cause on a bystander or a man aviation collision. So we're continuing the research, but uh, so far we feel that that limit of 250 grams is relatively safe. And of course, if you buy one of those drones right now, you don't need to register because it falls under that uh, that 250 gram threshold where we think uh, there's less uh, chances of an accident. So we can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, so here we, we've been collecting the reported incidents uh, month per month in Canada since 2016. And um, 
you can see here, of course, 2020, it was a particular special year because of COVID, there's less uh, lesser traffic. Uh, so there was a bit less reported. And you can see, of course, the seasonal patterns, right? There's way more people um, uh, flying drones and also flying man aviation during summer than winter. But overall, it's something that, that we track. And it's important to mention that here, all these incidents are so far reports so a pilot is in approach for example and he sees something in the window and he believes it's a drone he reported we take the track of that we follow up as much as we can although it's, it's really hard to to track all of this at this point but regardless we keep the data just to be aware uh, if there's any recent spike or, or something like that so since since we've been taking the data here in Canada, we have had actually two collisions uh, between a man aviation and an ARPAS. Thankfully, none of them, um, none of them had uh, had any injury. But it's important. It's, it's, a, it's a problem we know it exists, and we're we're trying to handle it through regulations and education, and trying to make sure that uh, everybody keeps flying in the safer way possible. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Ah, yeah, and here's also some stats that we've been taking uh, since 2014 of all the people flying drones and actually getting fined. So people that are flying outside of the regulations or that they're doing something, you know, completely legal with their drone, like flying on top of concerts or advertise events without the proper permission, flying on top of moving cars, like all these incidents, uh, different um, uh, police jurisdiction and uh, security forces around Canada has the uh, have the power to actually find people that are operating drones uh, in a non well, of course near airports I forgot that one it's an important one so RCMP all them they have the power to uh, find the people and of course we collect all that data to to see how this uh, this issue keeps uh, you know keeps evolving. So that, that's about it, what I wanted to say about the regulations and, and the statistics as I did. So I can, I can pass it to you and we'll see after if there's any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you very much. Uh, I should say that uh, Transport Canada and uh, Carlos from TC and uh, uh, Mark Espinant from DRDC uh, were kind of, uh, you know, the drivers actually for, uh, for NRC to start this investigation and they were of great support. So what's NRC's role in all that story? So this is kind of a regulation matter. <clears throat> so NRC's role actually here is to support the regulators and defense, Transport Canada, for example, here and DRDC with experimental data and damage analysis to create an evidence-based rules for drone airspace usage and procedures for aircraft operation. This is for civilian or military aircraft. And also the data was actually used by another partner or is being used at NRC to validate advanced FEA modeling for damage prediction of aircraft components. Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning, I showed you a picture of one of the cannons that NRC has. So we have, uh, we have small, we had small cannons. However, the study required a bigger cannon. So we built one. So NRC actually now has the biggest cannon in the world in terms of diameter this is about 17 25 inches for i think it's about 43 centimeters in diameter and it can fire drones at speeds up to 300 or 350 knots if needed so far we have done 250 but we can reach about 350 knots so and so using this scanner we have conducted pilot testing uh, on flat plates as well as selected aircraft components for part 25 category aircraft. Okay, so before we have done, before we've done the aircraft components, we started with doing impact testing on flat plates. So this allowed us, so we did that of course, as I said, in collaboration with TC, but also in partnership with, uh, with, uh, with, with, uh, with, the, with the FAA through Ashur and uh, Nair. Nair have developed kind of very, uh, advanced modeling and they needed the data to validate their modeling. So we have done that type of testing to be able to determine the impact force. So as you can see the, split, the plate here, on each corner of the plate, we had a thermal, uh, we, had, uh, we had a load cell 
to detect or to measure the impact load as the drone impacts the, uh, the plate. This is a typical uh, quadcopter drone. We are not thinking about any specific drone brand. It's mainly a quadcopter of that size and of that weight. <clears throat> You can see here uh, we have used kind of uh, kind of new technologies to determine the displacement or the deformation of the plate using DIC technology using those uh, uh, high speed cameras, two hundred thousand dollars each. This is very expensive material. Uh, you can see here other cameras that were used on the left on on the right bottom picture. You can see the cannon, the muzzle of the cannon, and you see other cameras used to determine the speed of the drone before impacting the target. Okay, so this is one of the examples uh, uh, of the test. So this impact was done on a thin plate. This is one eighth of an inch uh, thick plate at 250 knots. Uh, 250 knots is about 129 meters per second. And you can see on the top left picture of the drone before it touched the, the plate, and then you go uh, to the next one when it, it, it goes slightly through it. And then at the bottom pictures, you can see that the drone just passed through the plate. On the right bottom picture, you can see the, uh, the remains of the drone after the impact. It was completely destroyed because it did hit the floor after it penetrated the plate. Uh, some pictures that show the, uh, the deformation of the plate on the right side, uh, on the left side, and on the right side, you can see the, uh, the impact loads that we've measured uh, during the impact. We're reaching a maximum of about 22,000 uh, uh, 22, uh, yeah, 22, uh, uh, pounds. Now we have done, the, we have done the, the plate testing and then it was time to do a, a real testing on, on aircraft components or on aircraft parts. So what we have done, we have selected what are the parts which can be impacted by a drone. So of course you have the wings. In that case, it was the leading edge of, uh, of, of, of the wing. You can see here the part that we have selected for the impact. And also we, uh, we, we have impacted a windshield, very important actually. And the type of windshield that those aircrafts have it's, a, it's, you know, it's composed of three main structures. So you have the outside layer, which is just the outer glass pane. And then you have a structural vinyl interlayer. This is for bird impact resistance. And then you have the last structural inner glass pane, which is the main load bearing pane. <clears throat> so this is for the leading edge and for the, uh, the, uh, uh, the windshield. And also we have done, recently we've done testing, completed that testing in, in December and actually about two weeks ago. So what we have done, we have done empennage impact testing. This is an empennage of, uh, of a part 25 aircraft as well, because it's a huge. So we had to slice it in portions to be able to move it to the test facility. And as you can see, we have selected, you know, locations for the impact on uh, both the horizontal and vertical stabilizer of the aircraft. Okay, so we start with windshield testing here. So this is just this test setup of for the windshield testing. We have tested at two speeds, 140 knots, which is 72 meters per second and 250 knots. So for both tests, the battery of the drone was discharged less than 25% and the windshield, so we took the windshield from the aircraft, as you can see on the right, on top right, top right side picture, where you see the frame on which the windshield was installed. So we removed the windshield from the aircraft and did mount it on a fixture. Very important to mention that this doesn't, you know, this doesn't replicate a real boundary condition of windshield in the cockpit. So, but we had to do it that way. We didn't have another choice, but this just to have an idea how bad the damage could be. Uh, on the left, uh, on, on, the, on the bottom left picture, you can see a drone sitting in its sabo ready for, uh, to, be, to be launched. And on the picture at the uh, right bottom side, you can see the cannon 
and different cameras set there. So the cameras, you have different cameras, one camera or two cameras will measure the speed of the drone. Other cameras will allow us to measure the rotation of the drone before impacting the, uh, the, uh, uh, the component. So when I say imp uh, the, the, uh, the rotations, these are kind of pitch angle, yaw angle, and roll angle. These are very important to know, especially if you are doing simulation and wanted to validate simulations, you need to make sure that you are simulating the right impact orientation of the drone. <coughs> I'm sorry for that. Okay, so this is one of, after the test, so this is, this is the result of a test at 250 knots. And you can see the drone as it impacts and the cloud of glass uh, which we shattered from from which shattered from uh, from the uh, from the windshield. My pictures I have here, as you can see, uh, it's cloud of glass fragments uh, during the impact, and this was outside and on the inside as well. We don't have the pictures for the inside, but inspection of the windshield after the after the impact showed that you know the the structural pain was was twenty five percent of the glass of the structural pain was gone. That's what I want to talk. What, what I was talking about. Let me just show you here the video. There was no penetration, so the drone was 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 deflected after after the impact. But the damage to uh, to the windshield was was very significant. So what you see behind here are the this is the sabo, which is uh, the sabo is the container in which we put the drone, and it's foam based, so it it, it, do, it doesn't it doesn't matter it doesn't it doesn't contribute to the impact. So we go to the next one now for the leading edge. As I said, the same thing for the uh, for the for the uh, for the wings. They were too big, so we had to slice them in few portions. And this is one of the setup on you know top left side. So we have done test at 140 and 250. So the the uh, the, the left top side picture is for one uh, was a test for 140, where as you can see on the leading edge, so you have a slot, and the slot can be either retracted or deployed. So you deploy the, the you, you deploy it during approach, but it has to be retracted when you are cruising. So this test at 140 was kind of simulating approach speed. So the uh, the, uh, the the slots were were deployed. However, uh, on picture on the right bottom side, so the slot is retracted actually, and the test was done at, at 250 knots uh, 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 because we are kind of simulating a speed under 10,000 cruising under 10,000 feet. This is uh, impact at 250 knots, pictures taken from the high speed uh, uh, camera videos. And you can see the, uh, the sequence of the impacts. Complete destruction of the zone anyway, some, some damage to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the leading edge. So you can see here the damages. So the skin was uh, was was uh, was teared, uh, cracked uh, after the test. So this is the remaining of the battery at the bottom side here. Uh, what which was interesting for this test is that uh, 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 we, the slot could not be uh, uh, deployed after the impact. It was in the retracted uh, position, and we tried to deploy it after the test, and we couldn't. So this was kind of the worst test that we had. Uh, for the leading edge uh, testing. This is the video showing the impact at 250 knots. There you go. And of course, the drone is completely destroyed. Mm. Now for the empennage, the same thing, empennage. So uh, on the left side, so for the empennage testing, we decided to go ahead only with the 250 knots, 120, 129 
uh, meters per second on the leading edge. So uh, the empennage, as I, th I think I showed the picture before here, no, it was in the uh, previous ones. Anyway, so it was sliced. So uh, uh, on the left hand side, you see uh, the, uh, the, uh, the test setup for the, uh, for the horizontal stabilizer. And on the right hand side, you see the pictures for the vertical stabilizer testing. This is okay. So we decided then to do also another test with the bird. So bird impact. So we had to uh, use one of the of the segments of the of the of the of the horizontal stabilizer, and uh, but in that case actually we used a different cannon because the bird is small. So we used the six inch cannon as you can see at the the, the bottom side picture. I just show you now drone impact with the charged battery on. on the horizontal stabilizer. That's what happens. So actually the drone penetrated into the leading edge. And you can see the difference between, between uh, a leading, the leading edge of the empennage and the leading edge of the wing. The wing one is more robust. There is more structure there. So there was no penetration at all. However, here it was kind of full penetration all test we have done had pen have penetrated, except for one on the vertical stabilizer. These are pictures after, after, after the impact, and you can see fumes coming out of the uh, horizontal stabilizer. Uh, and of course, you know, there was ignition of the battery and we had to take this portion out, you know, because those fumes are very toxic. Now for the bird impact, we weren't, to be honest with you guys, we were not expecting to have this result, but we were kind of surprised. Look what happened. So the bird made it through. Of course, the bird here in that case, so it's a bird, again, it's, it's not a real bird, it's, it's a real bird. It's a chicken, but it's a carcass for the, it's, 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 you know, it's a dead, it's a dead carcass, okay? And and you need to uh, you need you to test it. You need to wrap it in a plastic bag. This is in accordance with ASTM standard F three hundred thirty dash sixteen. So to avoid the mess, you need to wrap it in a plastic bag and then <coughs> sorry and then launch it. So we had the same thing. We had full penetration, and you can see the the damage to the leading edge. Uh, really similar uh, to uh, what happened with with the drone. The only difference I could see here is the is the smoke, or maybe a little bit more damage with the drone, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very similar. If you wanna compare, so this is, this is the FAA, this is the FAA uh, uh, kind of damage severity uh, level, uh, or the ASSURE, I would say, uh, consortium level. So you have level one, if there is kind of just undamaged, very small deformation. Level two would be extensive permanent deformation on external, level three would be, skin fracture as this one level 4 would be kind of penetration and damage of you know to the uh, to the uh, to you know to 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 the, to the skin of of, uh, of of the components uh, here on the right side so we have as i said we have done a lot of testing on the leading edge on and and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 yeah on the leading edge of the uh, of uh, uh, of the wing, and so for uh, at at one for test one at one forty knots level one just a few dents, at one forty we had level two sometimes a kind of permanent damage, level two here at one forty another one at one forty level two so for for the one forty it was really level two not very not, not very severe damage uh, at at, at two hundred fifty knots depending on the test so for that test here we had a level two. However, for that one, we had the level three. Level three, that means there was extensive damage, but there was no penetration actually of the drone components inside the leading edge. I don't have a summary for the, uh, for, for, for the empennage, but I have it here kind of, kind of, uh, uh, kind of a general summary of, of, of the testing. So here, so this is the part 25 aircraft. This is the leading edge slot. <laughs> so this is for the deployed, you know, the, uh, for test one, test two, test three, test four, is for the deployed slots. That means we are simulating approach speed. So in terms of severity, 
we had level one, level two, and there was no risk of fire at all. If you go to the retracted uh, uh, slats where we are simulating cruising under, under uh, 10,000 feet, test number five and test number six, we had level two and level three. However, if you go to the windshield at 140 and 250, we consider that this is, even though there was no penetration, we consider that the windshield failed because you know the, the, the vision would be obscured 100% and actually possible you know, harm to the pilot behind. This has to be proved anyway with another type of testing, but we consider that the windshield fails. For the openage, <clears throat> So I had it. I have I have the table uh, 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 organized in a way where I have the ho horizontal stabilizer and then vertical stabilizer and then the bird on the horizontal stabilizer. So for test one, two, three, four, five, all. Oh, sorry. So I have level two. So they should be all level four actually. That because we had penetration. So this, this was a mistake. So in terms of severity, they were all level four because we had penetration. In terms of fire risk, so depending on the battery level. So if the battery level is low, so there is there will be no fire risk. However, if the battery level is kind of high or it, if it's full, we think that there is a fire risk because you know the battery uh, ignited during that test. For the vertical stabilizer, the same thing. It's level four. It should be level four here. I don't know why I had failed, but it should be level four. I'm sorry, I didn't correct that. So it should be level four for all of them, even the vertical stabilizer, as well as the bird impact. So this is the summary of my presentation. I wish I could have said more, but I thought I had another slide here. Okay, I thought I had uh, I had uh, I had a slide with a reference. Okay, so we have we have we have two reports. I'm sorry, I thought I had I had them here, but I can't see it. So uh, we have published two reports with a lot of details. You can go to NRC's website, uh, NRC uh, NPARC publications. And if you just uh, do a search under drone, for example, you will get the reports. They are free to download if you need to know uh, more details about it. I would like to thank uh, my colleagues who were very, very uh, helpful during that project. The technicians, Brian Galliotti, Alan Greer, Tim Breto and uh, our retired expert, bird expert, Ron Gould. I would like also to thank Transport Canada and the RDC for their great support during the last few years. Thank you very much and I'm open for any question. Thank, thank you, Azadine and Carlos. Very, very interesting. And, and uh, I guess another indication of some important work being done and the teamwork and the collaboration is very interesting to see and very en enlightening to see how different groups can come together to solve a problem. Your presentation was very interesting from the perspective you gave that these are real world problems you're attacking and then showing us the test results. The video uh, and the complexity of the test is are, are most uh, amazing and and also amazing is the fact you got a video to run during a presentation is is good on you as well. So thank you for that. There are some questions that I'll go through uh, uh, that came into the chat room, but please uh, other people, please put in your questions or your comments. The first one was, uh, where were you getting the data on the bird strikes? Was it coming from an FAA database? This was a question from Khalid. So the bird strikes, so yeah, so uh, for, for the Canadian one, it was it, it came from uh, Transport Canada and uh, the USA ca came from the FAA and they are available. So I uh, may be a question, this is from Akur, maybe a question perhaps more to Carlos is th this work was obviously concerned with the collision hazard uh, risk management and understanding that. Is there also work going on in the separation of drone and aircraft in terms of any turbulence and interactions from that? I guess maybe more uh, a risk to the, to the RPAS community for flying near aircraft. Is that something that's being looked at? So uh, absolutely, R right now with the regulations we have set up, there's uh, there's no flying around airplanes allowed. 
Now, in the future, we're looking at an integration between the man aviation and unmanned aviation, and the, specifically the RTM uh, group, the remote traffic management group, is working really hard at developing these. Basically, is the equivalent of ATM, but for ARPAs. So, uh, how to manage the ARPAs, how to be aware of where all the ARPAs are regard, respect to man aviations. And as part of that work, they will work on specifically on separation standards between man aviation and ARPAs. And I'm sure they're taking all that into consideration, the wake effects and, and all those, those details. Thank you, very, very interesting. And interesting to see the full breadth of the complexity of this problem. Uh, so uh, also a question from Akur, did you consider different impact angles and different types of materials, I guess, and maybe different manufacturers in, in how you designed the tests? And then maybe a follow-up to that is what, it, what involvement have you had from the OEMs in doing the uh, tests and this project? Um. Well, for, for, for the drone, we have used one type of drones only. It's a quadcopter. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, doing such test is very complex. So, uh, so the test may last just, uh, the test is that the impact is less than a second, actually. But uh, preparation for the test, you are talking about a month or more than a month for a single test. So using a different drone type, that means you need to design a different SABO and you need to go through uh, an extensive uh, calibration uh, 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 series of, of testing and it's not uh, it's not it's not an easy task you need to have a lot of resources and you need to have of course funds available for that so what we have done with transport Canada and the RDC we agreed that this is kind of uh, a nice drone which is representative of you know of that size and uh, and 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 we went ahead with it could could you extend that to the to the target? I guess. What about the di different angles of impact or different? Oh, structures? oh yes. Any, oh, you've it, done oh, all kind of oh. aluminum structures. Are you also looking at any composites, or I guess the aluminum would would cover the primary flight uh, or the primary structures? Excellent, Jeff. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. So okay, so in terms of angles, uh, 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 so. Uh, for the polymer, so we, we, we have we, we've thought we thought about it. So we, we have plans for the future to do it, uh, uh, but the, basically we are we focused really on kind of the alu aluminum skin for, for now. Uh, uh, for the you mentioned the angle the um, angle of impact. That's what you mean, right? Yes. Yeah. So for the angle of so for, for all our tests, so what we do we replicate what you know the, the real angle of for example the sweep angle is very important to respect. Because if you impact it, you know, at, you know, you know, perpendicularly, you are not representing a real case. Assuming that you have a drone which is moving forward and the aircraft is coming from the other side, so we need to respect the, the right angle. So we have respect to all the angles to simulate kind of a real impact in flight. If if I may add quickly towards the choose of the the the, the, the arpas that we that we tested, we did it basically. We look at all the forty plus thousand drones registered in Canada. And we looked at basically 50 to 60% where that specific one that we tested. And more than that, that that's a 1.2 kilogram drone. We looked at all the registered drones in Canada and we did the average of their weight and their weight come down to 0 0.9 kilogram. So the average weight of the drone registered in Canada is actually a little bit smaller than the one we tested, which makes these results a, a bit more conservative. And that's, uh, that's why we did it. And could, could you comment on the involvement of, of, I guess, the manufacturers, either the aircraft manufacturers or the drone manufacturers? Have they shown interest in this? Are they uh, lobbying, I guess, for any uh, participation in this kind of work? Um, I wouldn't say they have lobbied to participate in this particular work. I know they're interested in their results. But, uh, but no, they, they have not participated in this particular research. This was more internally for us at transport to start analyzing the severity of the impact if they happen. In parallel, we have another project that is analyzing the airspace uh, density in Canada to create an airspace model. So then we can pair the two results having the severity and the probability of a collision 
to actually occur to have a full risk picture. Because right now the severity is telling us, you know, what would happen if a drone is perfectly positioned and a man aviation aircraft hit it right on target on the worst possible condition. Regarding the angles we were talking before, that was to consider. So the speeds, the 250 knots is in the you know, uh, whole pattern under 10,000 feet. And then the 140 knots was approach speed. So all the angles were considered for both a cruise and approach uh, to, to, to terminal. Okay, good, thank you. Um, question from Simon. Uh, have you attempted to mimic the stiffness of the surrounding structure of the aircraft component or is the mounting structure considered to be rigid, I guess, in terms of the relative masses of the, the drone and the aircraft? So the question here was, or the comment was, not doing so would, in his opinion, significantly affect the results. Yeah. So here, so for the stiffness, for example, for the vertical stabilizer, for example, uh, so it's 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 a very massive. So that was I. I think we, we were representing this, you know, the, the real stiffness of, of the machine. We didn't need to, it's, it's, it, the weight was, I think, 1300 kilograms. The drone or, the, you know, the energy at which, you know, it was hit, of course, you can see the deflection of the impacted part, the damage, but there is no movement at all to the massive structure. However, when we have done the you know, the, uh, the, uh, the tip segments, because we had to slice them, for sure. We tried for the tip, uh, so we have done three tests on that segment. For the tip one, we tried to kind of constrain, you know, the uh, constrain the, uh, the stabilizer on one side and leave it, kind of have it overhang on the other side. But are we representing 100% the boundary condition? No, we are not. But I think we are close. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of damage severity, I think it's very close. Okay, thanks. If there's a follow-up question from Simon on that, please post them there. There's a, a few more that we want to try and get through. And uh, uh, Jeff, w w one, one other thing, what I want I wanted to add, yeah, and and the reason for that because it's 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 the size of the aircraft component itself. You have if you if you want to do it on real aircraft, you have you have to go outside and do it. This is this is the thing. However, we are planning. We are in 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 uh, uh, we are in the way. We are underway preparing testing for Part 23 aircrafts. Part 23 are, are smaller, and we will will kind of do the testing on the aircraft itself. This would be an interesting uh, thing uh, to do and to show in the future. Okay, that that's kind of a follow-on question from Simon. Do you think you can, or you're starting, or hoping to be able to use the data from these tests to predict? damage or severity in different aircraft or in different sizes or constructions of, of products, I guess, as you went from part 25 to part 23? I think it's different. So part 23 aircraft and part 23 are different. You know, the skin is, 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 is the structure is different. That's why we are doing, it's, it's, it's another, it's a different series of testing we'll be conducting over the next few weeks on part 23 aircrafts. Okay, thanks. But the speed, but the speed will be different anyway. So we are talking about maybe between 100 and 150 knots only, uh, instead of 250 for the Part 25 uh, aircraft. Okay, you in the beginning of it, you had sort of tantalizing parameters on whether the battery was charged or not charged, and then you laterally showed the the fume. So is one part of this study? Uh, this is from maybe John. Uh, is part of this assessing the fire risk that might be caused by a, by a, a lithium battery uh, damage hitting someplace near a fuel tank? Is that part of the project? Yeah, so, so, so yeah, part of the project is to assess if there is a risk of fire or not. So either fuel or not fuel, but we, we needed to know if there is a risk to, uh, you know, to, to have fire. Now, I think there is one, I can't remember which, uh, which, which, uh, which, uh, Airframe manufacturer, I think they are having fuel tank back in the empennage. Uh, I believe it's one of the Airbus aircrafts, I believe. It's a composite, I think, uh, empennage with a fuel tank uh, uh, installed there. So, yeah, so if, if this happens with, with a fully charged battery, this will be kind of, uh, I think, of, uh, of great concern to the, uh, you know, to the, to the community. Okay, so that the, the the drone is also seen as a as a flying lithium battery looking to start a fire someplace. 
and, the, okay. and, and actually the battery, the mass of the battery is very significant. You know, within the drone, it's, it's about 40% of the weight of the drone. It's, uh, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very significant. Yeah, well, one thing though we were not able to, to test in these conditions would be the amount of airflow going through the, you know, the hole created in the airframe where the battery would be potentially large. Like we know LiPo batteries are very unstable, but at the same time, over oxygenation can kill a battery fire. So we have, we can make some, I would say, preliminary conclusion from the data that a nurse is collecting, but I think we need to dig a bit deeper down the, the hole into specifically LiPo fire and the probability of, of, uh, of uh, fire inside an aircraft. Right, thank you. Uh, that, I guess, Azadine, your last comment about different structure uh, follows on to a question from Arlene. Uh, are you planning to do some tests with composite materials and multi-layer metal structures for impact um, because of the design of, of, of future or of current aircraft now with composite materials? Uh, sorry, Jeff, I'm sorry. I, I, lo I lost you. Can you say it again? So I, the question from Marlene was, is there some part of the program which will look at testing with composite materials and the, the damage tolerance of composite and I guess hybrid structures that would be composite and aluminum? Yeah, we've, it was, so we, we had discussion with, uh, with, uh, with Carlos and Mark from the RBC regarding the, uh, you know, the composite materials. Now, the, the issue with that is that you have different structures. So every uh, or each Air framer has a different composition. So which one are you gonna choose? And you know, is it gonna be conclusive or not? So we decided, so this is very important to do, but we'll wait a little bit. We have other things on the table to be done first, and then maybe we can switch to composite if there is something which is kind of more standardized so that we can test it. Yeah, but yeah, we thought about it, but we we haven't we haven't made our minds yet regarding testing this type of material. Okay. Uh, thanks, Carlos. If you if people are looking for the link for that NRC report, it's on the chat room at the 12:45 point. Um, the next question is from Anton. So, what Jeff, can I can I share my screen just because I have it there? Can I share it so people can see it? Can I share my screen one second, if you don't mind? So this is the uh, this is the link for the report okay. on the NRC's website. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, so the Anton's question is is sort of one asking about conclusion maybe for Carlos. Is there some expectation that uh, these tests will result in a new regulation for the FARs or the, or the Transport Canada regulations? Um, or would you be looking to consider the drone as similar to a bird in terms of damage as a function of weight? So, so far we are not looking into changing any, uh, you know, regulation regarding man aviation. Uh, one of the main goals of this study was, as I mentioned before, to provide a full risk picture of what would happen if a collision happened. There's a whole system around ARPAS, which we're developing right now, the, the ARPAS traffic management system, the detect and avoid solutions that will have to be on board the ARPAS or ground-based detect and avoid solutions. So all the system around the ARPAS is made such that the collision does not occur. So changing the current man aviation regulations seems a bit far-fetched right now. We're looking that, you know, there's there might be some difference with bird testing, with, with bird impacts, but not that big of a difference. And as I said, we're designing the whole system. So the probability of the correlation would be less probably than a bird collision. So in that sense, there's a whole umbrella of technology around that to, to avoid this from happening. Good, thank you. So uh, we're coming to the top of the hour. I think we have probably four or five more questions that uh, the Azadine and Carlos are willing to stay on for a couple more minutes, but I wanted to take this chance before maybe people would be leaving to thank you both and thank your team for some very interesting and insightful work. It's great to see Cassie is always interested in the art and the science and the business of engineering in Canada. And I think this was a, a great example of that. Todd has posted the link after the meeting uh, 
uh, with again with the agreement of the two authors the presentation will be available as a podcast so you can share it with your colleagues um, so uh, on everyone's behalf thank you for your time to do this and the effort to present it so if people want to stay around there's a couple more questions that i do but uh, thank you for your time and look for some other we have Cassie Ottawa talk lunch and learns like this talks for uh, March, April and May at least coming up. So keep an eye out and join Cassie because it'll be a good way to find out what's going on. Thanks. So can we go on to a couple more questions from Peter uh, with 100% battery, uh, what do you consider the combustible material uh, uh, contributions to fire or what kind of fire uh, dynamics are you looking at for this? That for me, for Carlos? Uh, either. <laughs> I guess I guess I can answer a little bit of that because uh, I have some LiPo experience in, in my previous life. And basically this particular study we did with NRC, we're looking, okay, did the fire, did the battery charge or not charge? Did it caught on fire or produce fumes? We're not looking in that level of detail and rigor at to the actual fire risk, because as I said before, when you have a plane flying at 250 knots, the amount of air going through that newly created hole against the fire, against the battery could potentially extinguish the fire. And then I said potentially, because we have no data to support that. We don't know if it's gonna make it worse or, or, or solve the problem, but all those details has to be considered when you're talking about fire risk. And, and again, light posts are very finicky but they not always caught on fire. It really depends on how the inner plies of the LiPo get broken when they crash against the, the, when they collide against the surface or plane or whatever they collide against. So, so as I said before, I think LiPo batteries, we need to dig a bit deeper into that to, to be able to conclusively say, you know, what level of fire risk produced. Also, because it depends on where they caught on fire, right? For in the particular Ampenash we tested um, a couple months, when if the ARPAS gets into the corner of the Ampenash where there's nothing behind and caught on fire, consequences might be, you know, small. But if it could, gets closer to where the control surfaces are in the hydraulic lines, then, you know, are the hydraulic lines able to handle the fire or not? And then you have major consequences. So, so I guess the, what I'm trying to say with a lot of words is that it needs a little bit more research to be done for LiPo fires. And we know it's a concern, but uh, at the same time, we have to be on top of the technology changing on the ARPAS world. Right now, most of the small ARPAS are you know, battery operated, but we don't know what the future holds at this point. Okay, thanks. A question from Ray Duan. Uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Did you try, have you yet or soon to, to, to compare the existing numerical solutions um, with the experimental results in a, as a way of reducing the, the test matrix that you have to do and how many, how many drones that you're killing? So maybe for you as a so, so so he, he he's asking about what exactly about whether the numerical analysis that you're doing the FEM analysis uh, is benefiting from the tests and whether you see the analysis as a way of reducing the number of actual tests that you would have to do. Yeah. So so what I can say so we so NRC we are starting the uh, the simulation. So but what I can say is that uh, NIR uh, this is the uh, national. Uh, Institute for Aerospace Research, I believe, out of Wichita University. So they, they have done a lot of, they, they have, they are very advanced in modeling. And our data actually, uh, uh, they use our data to fine tune their modeling. And, they, you know, they were very, you know, so for sure, testing will, will, will help reducing, uh, you know, uh, will help validating the models actually and reducing the number of tests as you go further. Yeah, but for NRC, we are just starting a project on modeling, so we are not we are not there yet. We still have a lot of time to you know to go. Okay, but but good to see that 
um, analysis being part of this because of the difficulty of testing and because you'd want to generalize your results as much as yeah. possible. Yeah. So yeah, that, of course. But go ahead. I, I was just, as you just say, from a regular perspective, we always like simulation analysis, but we need to be certain that that model or simulation was validated with the real test. So the way we see it at Transport is uh, specifically a task force is we want simulations and models that we know they were verified and then we're happy with the results and we can, you know, use the, use the results for our regulation and, and guidance material. Okay, good. So you, you see sort of a continuing partnership between DRDC and Transport Canada and NRC? Absolutely. Okay, and, and no um, big interest or big need to, to bring in any kind of air mobility consortium people into this to other than as observers? So in, in that aspect, right now, what, what we're working is in the next set of regulations for ARPAs, which is medium risk um, ARPAs operations. So we are looking at you know the, the urban air mobility that's that's coming but it's not a, you know it's not tomorrow so we're we're utilizing our resources both funding resources and the, you know human resources to work on the most current regulation that we're working on which is medium risk so a little bit smaller arpas in a bit more riskier operations but the urban air mobility will come later now they they will, they're welcome to participate in these studies if, if they want and as we mentioned we make the results public at, at the end of the day they were funded with uh, you know taxpayers money so we we try to make everything public for industry operators and manufacturers alike so yeah that would be my my short answer okay and i think the last question except for many comments thanking you and saying that was a great presentation uh, and looking forward to reading the report was maybe a more general run on on impacts of drones on I guess things underneath it whether they might cause fires and and, and uh, injuries to people rather than aircraft so is there part of Transport Canada that's looking at that part of the risk as opposed to the aviation risk uh, absolutely. As part of our R and D, as, as part of my R and D portfolio, we have a project with Western University and NRC that we're looking at specifically at human injury severity. So basically, how bad it is if a drone falls in your head, right? And, uh, and we're looking at that also with uh, the help of CREAC and one of their partner companies. Uh, we're looking at. A uh, company that develop a simulation environment where they can simulate a city center, have people walking, and then you can simulate a hundred thousand times an ARPAS flying over and randomly having a catastrophic failure and falling. And then you can actually calculate how much, how many times will actually hit somebody in a dynamic environment. Right now, our regulations are really conservative in terms of people on the ground. The you know, the operations for, for density of people, we consider that everybody's in a football field uh, distributed uh, evenly, looking up, waiting for an ARPAS to fall from the sky, which is very conservative again, because in reality, you have buildings, you have awnings, you have different structures in, a, in an urban setting that could, you know, the drone falling could potentially hit that before it hits you. So long story short, yes, we're looking into that. That's a very important aspect for us as well and as well as uh, as damage to property and infrastructure and, and all that aspect. Good. I, that That's really the end of the question. Thank you for your very detailed answers. And Carlos, thank you for joining. And Azadine, thank you for offering to do this presentation and to share with us this very interesting project. So uh, I'll conclude now. Uh, you still have kept uh, almost 40 people staying to listen to your answers. So very good impact. And, and I thank you for everyone's time and we'll see you again soon. Stay well and uh, think of, send us ideas for things, how we can help the aerospace community. Take good care of yourselves and have a good day. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thanks, take care guys. Bye. Stay thank well. You, bye. Todd, could you send a copy of the chat to Azadine and